Back in 1981, Jerry Howarth left Salt Lake City, Utah for what he thought would be a two- or three-year assignment as a Toronto Blue Jays baseball broadcaster. 36 years later, having been half of one of the all-time great baseball broadcasting teams, Jerry retired. His observations on those years can be found in his new book, Hello Friends, Stories from My Life and Blue Jays Baseball, and it brings Jerry Howarth to our studio tonight. It is so good to see you again. You too, Steve. Good to see you. I got to say, I, and we're going to go through the book here, I think it is hilarious that you had a four-decade-long career in broadcasting that almost never happened because you got your, key, your teeth kicked in as a kid playing street <laughs> football, and what kind of broadcaster can you be if you don't have any teeth in the front? That's exactly right. I mentioned that in the book, fifth grade, and I remember the classmate Rod Thorne. We went up for a football on the playground, and the next thing I know, they're picking me up and taking me to the dentist, and all four teeth were saved somehow, and I was very happy for that, never knowing what I would be doing. I do have to tell you, I'm, I, you're very candid in the book about your background, which, of course, I knew nothing about. You always sound so happy on the radio. And I want to read something from the book that I think will surprise people. Here we go. Sheldon, bring the graphic up. This is an excerpt from the book. I grew up with conflict and fighting and anger and alcohol. I would lie awake in bed at night telling myself as I heard the uproar in my house that I would avoid conflict at all costs for the rest of my life, that I would not drink, that I would learn to walk away. Jerry, what was going on in that home of yours? Well, my parents, it was a classic um, World War II. They met for a month. My dad then went to um, the Pacific, was on the USS Guardfish. And then after that, they came back and got married. So they really didn't know each other. And it just didn't work out. There was a lot of conflict, a lot of fighting. And when I was lying in bed hearing all that, and they were on the verge of getting a divorce, which they did right after I graduated from high school, I said, that's not for me. I don't want to go that route. And luckily for me, I did not. And I liked my parents for what they were. And I was very happy they each remarried people that they were on the same level with. But together, they, it was not a good mix. You say you liked your parents, but you say in the book at one point you hated your mother. I really did. And this is where uh, going to the University of Santa Clara, a Jesuit school, I met Father John Shanks, who next to my father was easily the most influ influential person in my life. And he was the one at a retreat who told me, Jerry, don't look at your mother as you think she should be. Look at her as she is. Love that person. Do the best you can with that. And I did. And I thank Father after that because it patched up a relationship where at least it was civil rather than just putting her off to the side. Okay, let's get you behind the microphone now. You want to hear what you sounded like a long, long time ago? <laughs> uh -oh. We actually, I mean, the funny thing is, you know, you're known for baseball, but you didn't start in baseball. You actually started in football. And uh, let's hear a little snippet of you many, many years ago, okay? Okay. Fire away, Sheldon. Let's go. And now your sportscaster, Jerry Howard. From Baker Stadium on the campus of the University of Puget Sound, it's time for Logger Football. Hello, everybody. This is Jerry Howard. And right now, let's bring in Doug MacArthur, who just came up from the field. Doug? Oh, my goodness. How many years ago was that? <laughs> That was September 3rd, 1973. Oh my gosh, Jerry, you sound the same. Like well, you were really good right from the get-go. Well, it was a good start. I enjoyed it. Doug made me relax. And he's the one, Steve, who actually gave me my break and said, Jerry, I've heard your tape. You can do this. He gave me his football and basketball job as the broadcaster. He continued as the athletic director. And I, when I heard that, too, just a couple of years ago for the first time, I couldn't believe it either, how natural it seemed to be. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that happened to you in the middle of calling a, I guess it was a AAA baseball game, which is the level just below the major leagues, you heard a voice, as you describe it in the book, saying, without me, this is meaningless. What was that? It was about a month into my career in Tacoma, and there was a foul ball hit down the left field line, and I called it. And as I paused, I did hear a voice in my head that said, without me, this is meaningless. I'd grown up in a church. Uh, I knew about God, and it was a, a God-fearing life that I tried to live. And so I completed the broadcast. And that night, I said, Jerry, you have to act upon this. So the next day, I drove downtown, found a church in Tacoma. I dropped onto my knees, and I said, God, I heard you. Without me, this is meaningless. Let me dedicate the rest of my career to you, that every broadcast is entertaining and informative, but I do it for you. And thanks for the opportunity. And that was a month into my career, which spanned 41 years. I don't want you to think this is a sacrilegious question, OK? Yes. But is it, is it odd for the Almighty to appear at a baseball game <laughs> to you? 
Well, what I always tell people too is be yourself. I remember interviewing Roy Halliday about what his work ethic worked for other pitchers. And he said, no, you have to listen to your own body. And Steve, I've been blessed with a life where God has really directed a number of things in my life. I don't wear it on my sleeve, but I live it. I'm appreciative of what's happened to me. And when I look back upon my career, a lot of benchmarks had to do with God saying, Jerry, you're going to be fine here. Just relax and enjoy what you're given and do the best you can with it. You didn't get the Blue Jay broadcasting job in year one, but you eventually got there. You got there in year three, and they t teamed you up, of course, with the, um, with the wonderful Tom Cheek, and there you were, Tom and Jerry, the second famous Tom and Jerry <laughs> yes, tandem in the right. world. What was it like working with Tom? Well, it was great because I move into Toronto. He's already been here five years. He is definitely physically the big cat. I'm the little mouse running around, so it was a perfect fit. And Tom was very gracious to me from the very first game that I did when he said, Jerry, here's a recorder, go broadcast, uh, go interview your first game, uh, uh, whoever you want for the pregame show. But together we worked as two professionals. And it was never about us, it was about the game. And we weren't former players, so we didn't talk about what should be done here, they should do that there, no. We had a good camaraderie on there, it was very professional. But what I liked the most is that Tom and I were completely different, on the mic and off. And I think those make for the best teams uh, then you know who's on the air. That's Jerry speaking. No, that's Big Tom with his baritone voice. We prepare differently. We broadcast differently. But what I like most about him, and I was so happy he was the number one announcer back in April of 77, he was a sophisticated Blue Jays fan. When they won, he was so happy. When they didn't do well and they were losing, he showed that emotion too. Whereas for me, it was pretty much, here's the game. Let's highlight the highlights. And that made for a great complimentary broadcast. Would you say you were friends? I'd say we were friends. We didn't do things together, but we were friends. And I got to know his wife, Shirley. There are three kids, and there are other, I believe, nine grandchildren. We still keep in touch with Shirley. It was a great family. And together, I think the, our two families appreciated that Tom and Jerry worked at their craft. It was not about them. It was about the audience in Canada, the people here in Toronto. So yes, we were friends that way. And you can be friends without having to socialize and do a lot together. I don't think you mentioned this in the book, Jerry, and if you did, then I missed it, because my recollection is, and you straighten me out here if I'm wrong, you did such a solid for Tom Cheek in the 1992 World Series. Just to remind everybody, it's game six, it's in Atlanta, it's extra innings, the Jays take the lead in the top of the 11th, so you know in the bottom of the 11th, if Atlanta doesn't score or doesn't score enough, it's over. And the 11th is your inning. You should have called the first ever Blue Jays World Series victory and you gave it to Tom to call that inning. Have I got that right? You do, you have that right. And, and actually, Steve, that's my favorite call as a Blue Jay announcer. <clears throat> because when the Blue Jays did score, Tom after the ninth inning, he did the 10th, I did the 11th, and we went every other inning. And after Dave Winfield hit that double, I realized, Jerry, do the right thing. I missed the first five years. Tom, the first three years, called over 100 losses each year. <laughs> and he was the Blue Jays broadcaster. I was happy to be part of the team. So when we came back, unbeknownst to him, then that's made it spontaneous. You didn't I, tell him ahead of time. I didn't tell him ahead of time. So we come on after the commercial break, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, I've had the pleasure of calling Dave Winfield's two-run double for the lead, four to two. Here's my partner, Tom Cheek, to take you the rest of the way. He was so floored. He took the microphone. Thank you, Jerry. And with great joy and enthusiasm, he called that bottom of the inning. Timlin to Carter. Blue Jays win the World Series. And Steve, I was happier that he called it than if I had called it. That is, that is the definition of a mensch right there. Good for you. Um, I would say, I listen to a lot of baseball. You're one of the happiest guys in the booth I ever hear. But one time, you called out the former Blue Jay shortstop, Jose Reyes, and you gave him H-E double hockey sticks on the air. And Paul Beeston almost fired you over it. What happened there? Well, it was a two-story uh, event. Uh, Jose had allowed a couple of ground balls to go through his legs up to the series in Minnesota. Now this is the 2015 season where the Blue Jays are about a 500 club. Mm -hmm. And then on Friday night with Mark Burley, my good friend on the mound, a third ground ball went right through his legs. And I said, the Blue Jays are not going to the playoffs with Jose Reyes at shortstop. Then on Sunday, a fourth event happened where there was a ground ball and Jose, a routine ground ball, threw it well over the head of the first baseman. And I said, once again, if the Blue Jays are going to the playoffs, they need to have a different shortstop because he's hurting everybody on the team. And I pretty much left it at that. I've always told young broadcasters, if you're going to be constructively critical, pretend that that player is right there to your left. 
So I did. I always did that in my career. So I had told Jose already, this is how I felt. Mm -hmm. The problem was, three days later on Wednesday, on Dean Blundell's morning show, he asked me to come on. I knew what he was going to talk about. I had two ways I could have gone. One, just say, Dean, I'm not commenting on it. I already did. Mm -hmm. Two, let's address it. And that's when three, as my boy, as my son <laughs> Joe said, we heard dad's voice. Dad got a little bit firm. And I started to think about Burley and everybody else and the playoffs. And they were suddenly slipping away because of Reyes. And I got too firm. And that night, Beeston called me into his office. I've known Paul since day one. He says, Jerry, first thing he said was, I'm not here to fire you, but I'm disappointed in your tone of voice and how you said what you said. And I said, I am too. I went the wrong way. Uh, I was good on the air, being constructively critical, but I went too far. And the capper to the story was Alex Anthopoulos, a great friend. He and Paul Beeston were the ones who called me after my surgery with J.P. Aaron Sebia. Mm -hmm. Alex said, Jerry, it took us another almost three weeks to make that deal for Troy <laughs> Tulowitzki because Colorado kept asking me, what's wrong with Jose Reyes from what we're hearing? And luckily for me, the deal came. Tulowitzki was instrumental in 15 and 16. And um, I have no regrets about what I said, but it was that tone of voice that probably could have been much softer. Gotcha. Jerry, we're going to do a bit of a lightning round of uh, baseball quiz questions here, okay? Yes. I would, I mean, you've seen like as much Blue Jay baseball as anybody in the world alive today. So let's go through this. Who's the best Blue Jay pitcher ever? I would say Roy Halladay. Oh, Jerry, you're wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> Dave Steve would be a close second. I would say the other way around, but that's okay. Uh, who was the best player ever to put on a Blue Jay uniform? Roberto Alomar. On that, you are correct. Who's the best player you ever saw on any team in Major League history? Well, the two, Roberto Alomar and growing up in San Francisco, Willie Mays. He is the greatest of all time still. Who's the greatest hitter that ever lived? Greatest hitter who ever lived? Well, that's a great question. That's an easy question, Jerry. I'm going to have to say Pete Rose. Jerry, I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> it's Ted Williams. Everybody knows that. Well, he was very good. No question oh, about it. Okay. Um, this one we're going to fight about as well. Who hit the most important home run in Blue Jay history? Roberto Alomar. Oh, my God. Like, how do you not say Joe Carter? Well, because if it weren't for Roberto's home run <laughs> in 92, and the Blue Jays lose that series to Oakland, there would be no Paul Molitor, Dave Stewart, Joe Carter. I don't think the Blue Jays would have even gone back to the World Series in 1993 without Roberto getting the choker's label off the shoulders of the Blue Jays. <laughs> okay. So all, all Joe Carter did was hit a home run that won a World Series, which has only <laughs> happened twice in 100 and how many years, and that's not good enough to be number one on Jerry Howard's list. Okay, I got it, I got it. What's a better name, Sky Dome or Rogers Center? I would like to see both, the Sky Dome at the Rogers Center. Well, that'd be okay. Who's your favorite Blue Jay ever? Tom Hankey. Ah, uh, the Terminator. The Terminator. He was wonderful, yes. Wonderful heart, great pitcher, and just a tremendous family man. Uh, what is your favorite Blue Jays trivia question? Who was on deck when Joe Carter hit the World Series home run to win it? Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Is it Alfredo Griffin? Very good. Okay. It was. All right, good. That put a lot of pressure on me there because I think I know my <laughs> baseball. And actually, you, you had another great trivia question in the book about uh, Willie Mays being on deck. For, which, for whose home run? Bobby Thompson's Bobby home Thompson's run. Bobby Thompson's. Of Ralph Rankin. And Miracle on Coogan's Bluff. Okay, Jerry, I got to take you to what I thought was your greatest call ever. This is just my opinion. What do you always say when a Blue Jay hits a home run? There she goes. Okay. Here we are, 2015, Blue Jays hosting the Texas Rangers. It's the decisive game five in the American League Division Series, and a guy named Joey Bats is at the plate. Roll it, please. One and one on Jose. All eyes on the mound, and the bearded Sam Dyson. Now he comes set. Kicks the 1 1 pitch. Fly ball deep left field. Yes, sir. There she goes. You love that one in particular. I could tell from your voice. Now, here's we're going to let this breathe a little bit here. We just want to keep playing the video because remember, you've made the there she goes call, and now we're hearing nothing. And I want to know how you resisted the temptation to get in there and over broadcast as opposed to let the thing speak for itself. Well, I let that crowd noise go for almost a minute because I enjoyed the bedlam at the Rogers Center, Steve, like the fans. I didn't want to get in the way of that. And on radio, the art of radio is to make the fans feel that they're right there at the ballpark. And that was my way of showing that. 
Were, were you as hepped up on that as I thought you were, as it sounded in your voice? I was for this reason. That top of the inning, which was very controversial, and Texas taking the lead on the mm -hmm. throw by Martin Ooh. back to the mound, hit the bat of Shin Su Chu. The top of the inning and the bottom of the inning took 53 minutes to play. <laughs> and because of the fans throwing things on the field and they were so upset and probably rightfully so, the emphasis was, there she goes. There's that dad's voice again. <laughs> but it was an inning that is historic in playoff history in Major League Baseball for the length of it and the end result. Was that the best? Well, in my opinion, that's your best call ever. What do you think your best call ever was? Well, I enjoyed the Winfield double we talked about yes. in the World Series. That would be my next one. And then the following year, I loved the 11th inning call that I was fortunate to have. Edwin's walk-off home run. Oh. Yes, sir, the Blue Jays are going to Texas. Because they'd won the wild card game. That was the wild card over game. Over the Orioles. That's right. That yeah. put them in the playoffs going out to Texas. That was nice, too. Jerry, at some point you made a decision, after getting a letter from somebody, that you weren't going to say the nicknames of teams that had indigenous-related nicknames, like Cleveland Indians. Uh, why did you make that decision, and how did you avoid saying Cleveland Indians for the next many years? Well, after the 92 World Series, I was like everybody else. Braves, Indians, powwows, tomahawk mm -hmm. chops. Didn't think anything about it. And then about a month after the World Series was over, Steve, I've got a, I, I got a fan letter from somebody at First, First, Men, First Nations member up north. And they said, Jerry, we love your broadcast, but we also want you to think a little bit more about what you say regarding powwows and tomahawk chops because it's so offensive to us. We don't have any voice, but you do. And all we're just saying is think about what you say regarding this and so many other areas like Chief Wahoo, the red-faced uh, mascot mm -hmm. for Cleveland. It was such a heartfelt letter. I wrote him back and I said, I think his name was Jim. I wish I still had the letter. I wrote him back and I said, Jim, what you said has touched my heart. For the rest of my career, I'm not going to use the words Indians or Braves. That was after the 92 season. And I didn't for the rest of my career through 2017. It just... I wanted to, in my own way, just respect the opinion of so many on those um, uh, first member nations there without getting involved too much in politics or whatever. I just felt that I wanted to do that for them. Hmm. 24 years ago was an awful year for baseball because there was no World Series. There was a strike that year, but it was a pretty good year for you and your family. How come? Well, we became Canadian citizens. Uh, 1994, Paul Godfrey's wife, Gina, was a citizenship judge. There were 53 of us there representing 13 countries. And I wanted to live here the rest of my life. And I wanted our boys to have that opportunity as well. We came up as landed immigrants. We love Canada. It's our country. That's what led to hello friends, not just hello everybody. Mm -hmm. So we became citizens. And uh, as Gina left, I said, and there she goes. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Do you feel different now that you're Canadian? No, this is a wonderful country. Uh, we have enjoyed every year here. I spent my first 35 years in the States my last 37 and counting here. And Canada is our home and native land. I look at it exactly that way. And uh, I'm just so happy I came up here, not only to broadcast, but become part of the fabric of not only Ontario and um, Toronto, but all across Canada. Well, again, for those uh, who aren't necessarily sports fans who have hung in there through this interview, when anybody hits a ball that goes foul, but starts fair, Jerry has a way of calling it. What do you say, Jerry? Hooking, hooking, and then I don't know what the end result is. <laughs> Foul. Well, Jerry, I'm just going to say this interview is hooking, hooking, over. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great interview. I, I so appreciate you making the time for us. The book is called Hello, Friends, Stories from My Life and Blue Jays Baseball, and it's brought Jerry Howarth to our studio. And uh, many, many happy years ahead for you and yours, I hope. Steve, thanks for having me. I've enjoyed our friendship. Me too. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.